Professor. On this episode, I'm going to be joined by three very talented UX designers who are going to be sharing their experiences about working in industry. Let's meet them. Uh, I'm Dimitri Billick. I am a UX designer at Hilton. I work on Hilton's mobile app, which allows users to book um, stays and manage them, uh, earn points and all that stuff. Hi, I'm Gwen Frederick. I'm also a UX designer at Hilton. I focus more at the property, which is like your TV experience and basically the front desk people, the teams that are able to order anything for you. Cool. And I'm Kyle, um, Kyle Bridges. I'm a product designer, uh, so I'm a pixel pusher, and I make everything look good. <laughs> Extremely good. <laughs> so basically, I didn't choose this career per se, it chose me. Um, I, I studied uh, music performance and um, like uh, audio engineering in university. And I started freelancing in that field. Uh, I did that um, while I was still in university and for a number of years afterwards doing shows and studio recording, music production, sound design, um, a bunch of stuff. And um, during that time, I got uh, progressively more interested in technology. Um, I, I'm a self-taught programmer. Um, I was doing that as a hobby. Initially that started as me um, just trying to make a portfolio site for my music work and then you know as I got more into technology and obviously design plays a big part in that. I'm thinking about problems like for me problem solving was a big thing and then there was an opportunity uh, through my sister actually. She works, uh, she used to work here and um, so I met her team uh, probably like a year before I started here and I you know, got to talking with some of her um, team and there was a junior position that opened up and I was at a point in my um, music and audio career that it wasn't really what I wanted to be doing anymore. Um, and it just seemed like a great opportunity and a really interesting field. So I sort of um, was, uh, you know, building the plane while it was flying in terms of my skills um, when I first started. but. Uh, glad to say that I am still here and I've learned a lot. <laughs> so what I got into UX design from industrial design. That's what I studied in, which is basically hardware, um, color, material, finish, but um, I was actually in medical design, which was a lot of human factors engineering and ergonomics, and then we also had to do physical user journey, like where the nurses are, where the doctors are, where the patients are what needs to be sanitized, things like that. And so it just, I just literally fell into UX design, but from a hardware perspective. And then suddenly I switched over to LG and Belkin where I got into consumer electronics and that got me interested in software design. I was never a graphic designer, but I could technically do graphic design, like the skills for Illustrator, Photoshop, and then eventually Sketch came onto the, the market and that was a tool I commonly use now. Um, I actually really like it. It's it, like what Dimitri was saying about problem solving. It's the same thing for me with critical thinking. I mean, my first UX design job, I had a really awesome boss. He was in his interviews and his other interviews, he was looking for critical thinkers not so much as like how well you are doing graphic design, but he was really into how can you make decision trees, how can you prioritize the features, how do you like interview the guests or the um, customers, whoever is your buyers, and then how do you distill that information into insights? Um, I was actually an accounting major in uh, college and I needed to earn money on the side. So I started designing stuff for my brother who had a small marketing company um, and it was like a sweatshop. So I was designing late into the night. Anyways, um, so um, yeah, that's how I learned how to design. Um, I love creating beautiful things. I love creating, um, I love building in the physical world um, and also the digital world. I'm not an artist. I don't, you know, take a piece of paper places and draw sketches of things. I can't even draw a straight line. Um, so thank God for computers. But um, yeah, I 
got into design. I learned how to code after college as well, but eventually um, you have to choose a path, and I chose design. And since then, I've been creating um, on the web, on mobile apps, um, on print as well. And design is just one of those things that you can take it anywhere you want. Um, and it's kind of up to you how good or how fast you can progress. So yeah. it's a wonderful that, thing. That, that's one thing that I would like to add that I feel like we share, and you might have a question about this, but I do feel like every designer that I've run across so far is usually someone that's very self-starting and that is constantly consuming new information about how you know why things are the way they are what different patterns are in the design world and and i feel like that's something that that designers generally the good designers share that trait of like essentially always learning and always trying to improve and not really waiting for someone to sort of be like okay now do this and then do that you know there are some jobs that are like that um, to be successful in design, I feel like you really need to. I work to. with some designers like that. <laughs> yeah. That they just want a paycheck and mm -hmm. go surfing. Right. <laughs> I feel like that comes later, though. <laughs> no, they're so younger you, than me. Oh, really? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, and this might go into one of your next questions is, is like, what type of schooling do you need to become who you are? Um, and you're going to find, uh, like, a wide spectrum. Like, some people, you know, they've been doing this since they were 12. Um, and you, other people, oh, I, you know, I merged over from another career. Because, um, and there's a lot of people who, you know, like me and Dimitri, like, we learned how to do what we do, you know, in the back alleyways of the internet, you know? So, like, there's so many roads to get to where you want to go. You just have to push yourself onto a road. But I think it is important that regardless of what road you get onto, um, there's always going to be a foundation of everything um, that you have to dive down into and once you find the real true foundation of everything that you're trying to learn you'll be set on the right path in the right pace yeah i think my story is different from kyle dimitri's because i went to a top design school um but just in a different department mm -hmm. but we used the same tools we had the same design process of what people term as design thinking i mean industrial design was really really aligned with what idea was 20 years ago and that's when I was in school and that we were obsessed with whatever philosophy that came out of IDEO. Um, but knowing that, the industry has shifted. So a lot of my colleagues that were industrial designers could not get jobs because that went to China or to other countries. And UX was growing. It was not a term back when I was in college. It was, it was just like, you're just a, like a, a, a human-centered computing or something like that. And I'm like, human computing? What the? <laughs> what is that? Yeah, can we swear on this? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'm very good at not swearing. Good job. <laughs> that's, that's like 15 years of corporate. Right there. <laughs> um, so to Kyle's point about skills, Skills is one thing. Another thing is don't take your work personally. Don't think your work is who you are because you're never going to grow. Once you hear one negative feedback from some stranger in a boardroom, you're just going to be crushed and never want to work again or never feel like you're going to succeed. So whenever any kind of criticism you get, don't get defensive, but then ask them, where is that coming from? Why did I say that? Um, that way you can be a better designer on top of the skills that you're learning. Okay, so our designers have given us um, a pretty detailed overview, right, of their personal stories. Um, and we kind of started talking about skills versus education versus transferring over from another department or major. Um, so I receive a lot of questions from viewers and students asking about um, how do they know if they want to go into research or if they want to go into design? Um, and something I've noticed in the market recently is that a lot of companies are hiring for this hybrid position called UX researcher slash designer, right? Um, yeah, so either they're trying to be um, economic and save money, you know, with a two in one. Um, or is it because they truly feel like there are certain skills that researchers and designers share? So what is your perspective of 
um, how UX research ties into UX design? Um, yeah, I can start. Um, I think that, to your point, definitely designers, again, like the good designers that I've worked with so far, um, share a common inquisitiveness mm -hmm. that obviously would be very common to your researcher as well. Um, it seems to me that um, like research, as far as what I've seen so far in my career, um, tends to be very focused on uncovering the problems. But if you're not as interested in necessarily crafting the specific solutions for it, then like UX design or UI design wouldn't really be um, probably the right path. Like but if you're you, more interested- But is it the researcher's job to give you the solution or is it the designer's? That's what I'm saying. Okay. It's, it's the designer's job to actually come up with the solution. Okay. So if you aren't as interested in like using the research that you acquire, um, whether you're a UX designer or a researcher, if you're not interested in applying that towards a specific solution, then probably the design aspect of it is less relevant to you. If you're more interested in just like thinking about problems and uncovering problems, that's more of like a research focused job, right? Because it's not really their job to necessarily come up with a specific solution. They well, can come up with recommendations, okay, of course. Okay, fair. I mean, I guess I was gonna disagree with you in the aspect of a researcher is not responsible for coming up with solutions, but I always felt like researchers that I've worked with, right, make them, you, you could separate good from okay researcher when the good researcher actually gives recommendations uh, or actionable, let's yes, say, recommendations. Yes. It's not like fix this, I but agree. fix yes. this by making this smaller or a different color right. or et cetera. Absolutely. Or like a, a couple of different options. Right, like right. these are the likely things Got that it. you can try and then mm -hmm. we can do another test to see okay. if that addresses the issue, something like that. Yeah. Okay, how about you guys? What's your experience? I think, I mean, every, company obviously wants a hybrid of everyone, mm -hmm. but I think it does go back to the thing of a jack of all trades. Yes, the more things that you can do is great, but the less you're actually really good in a certain area. Okay. Unless you're Gwen. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I feel like you know, UX researching and design are such broad and they encompass so many things mm -hmm. that it's hard to do all of that throughout a project life cycle and not be able to focus on it and also improve your skill in that uh, space throughout different process, uh, projects coming to you. You know, as a designer, you're always learning how to be a better animator, you know, illustrator, designer, and stuff like that. Researchers, on the other hand, they're the same thing. You know, they're, it's kind of like the gym. You're constantly working out, working out your mind. Um, <laughs> I need to go more often. But um, it's like speaking of <laughs> when you when you don't flex that muscle in the field that you're supposed to, you will get weaker over time. And so that's why um, it is great to you know know about both fields. But you know there are some trade offs to doing it all. Yeah. I mean, I I would add on to that with the whole practicing that muscle because there's been times I had to switch between researcher and designer, and if I haven't researched anything in like, even just three months apart, you're like, you feel like you're on rusty wheel, oh, because okay. you're like, uh, why can't you're I say that question without yeah. being leading on? And this, <laughs> yeah. So um, back to like Dimitri's point about like, a, knowing if you're a designer is based on, you like to make a solution. Mm -hmm. There's this um, matrix or uh, process called double diamond. Double um, diamond? Yeah, mm -hmm. double diamond. Okay. Double diamond. Sounds hard. <laughs> it's two diamonds. Two diamonds. Two diamonds. Two diamonds. Okay. Um, <laughs> the British came up with it. Of course uh, they did. British. Of course. <laughs> um, so the first diamond is the problem space. So really understanding what is the problem. And this is where researchers can be great at framing problems because a lot of times when it comes to a designer which is in the solution space, the second diamond, mm -hmm. designers just once they see a pain point, they're like, okay, we got a solution for that. Mm -hmm. And then right. the researcher's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh -huh. Let's collect all the pain points. Let's interview twenty people. Mm -hmm. And then the designer's like, right. it's just it's just more I got a wire. I got a wire. <laughs> Let me test it. I got a wire. Uh -huh. And they're like, we gotta get the whole picture first. Makes right. sense. And that's, yeah, and that's important because like uh, a lot of times 
the specific problems or pain points that you find in a, you know, a particular screen or whatever thing you're working on that the business is coming to, to you and asking about is, can be sim just a symptom of a larger problem and that's what research can help you uncover. Yeah. Um, so uh, you know, you're, it's not, you're not always gonna be in a position to make that call or to put the brakes on something just because you know that there is a deeper rooted issue but it's at least something that you can use as another asset to you in the design process and communicating with the relevant teams and stakeholders to be like, hey guys, like, you know, well, we have problems X, Y, and Z that are very specific, like usability issues in this flow, but are they symptomatic of a larger problem? And can we, you know, do some research around like this bigger, more holistic uh, view of things to see if we can like address those problems by solving like a deeper rooted one? But to your point about a hybrid position, mm -hmm. I absolutely don't see a problem with that as mm -hmm. long as the company is aware of what is this hybrid position is for. Okay. It's the same thing with UX and UI, uh -huh. or as they call it, like product designer. Mm -hmm. uh, even when I hear different companies talking about product designer, it's like Podge, product manager, mm -hmm. UX designer, mm -hmm. UI designer, and, a little, and having some good researcher kind of notes of how to do that is a product designer. So that, like, that's a unicorn. <laughs> so um, Gwen actually brings up a good point and she mentioned uh, UI designer, right? So I don't know if our viewers are familiar with the difference between UI designer versus UX designer. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I mean, it's, it's actually really hard to tell the difference. Well, what do they stand for first? Um, so there's user experience okay. and then there's user interaction. Okay. Uh, user experience, if you really think about it, is the steps going through something. Okay. While the user experience can be about the aesthetic. Like, think of yourself walking into the post office. Okay. You have to open up the door. You have to stand in line. You might have 20 people there. And then you have to meet the clerk. And then you talk to that clerk. You do the transaction. You put your credit card or you give them cash. And then you walk out the door. That's mm -hmm. the flow. Yes. While the user interaction is... How does the door look like? Do you open it or is it a turning door? Uh -huh. How is it like a line that goes around a table mm -hmm. or goes around the building? Or how even the, the appearance of the clerk, whether they're wearing, mm -hmm. do you have like that little plexiglass shield and then you have to take your box somewhere else to move it somewhere thing? Okay. So that's one way of looking at the two different. Okay. Um, and as roles. as designers, do you guys do both of those or just one? I think that we, like the responsibility for one versus the other is very you know clear cut. Like we all understand. Like me as a user experience designer, I'm responsible for what Gwen was talking about the flow, the sequence of things, mm -hmm. how things function in the application or whatever it is that we're designing. Um, and from a UI standpoint. It's making sure that things are visually consistent, that there is a systematic approach to things, that the hierarchy is, you know, like easy to scan. That that's so that's um, like we explore. We both explore in each other's sort of like realms mm -hmm. to come up with solutions. I mean, yeah. ideally, I think. Why that, did you point at Kyle? Because uh, Kyle is our fabulous user interaction. Oh well, speak up. Um, then. Well, <laughs> another way to put it is like. UX is like blueprints, right? There's gonna be four rooms, one story, two story house. But a UI designer is more like the interior designer, right? What, what is the house really gonna look like? You know, what, what's the furniture inside of it's gonna be? Color of the walls and stuff like that. Is there music playing? Is there incense floating in there? <laughs> we okay. take care of all that stuff. Okay, okay. So what comes first, the flow or the appearance? Like, I guess my question is, in, in the things that you were explaining right now, um, I wouldn't know which one would come first. So I feel I like, feel like, like, I feel like the, when you're asking the question of what comes first is actually a very biased question. Um, <laughs> sorry, because, well, not, not to you, but oh. to us. Like, because obviously Kyle will be like, yeah, we've got to know the colors and the material and finish of mm -hmm. what, what is the branding mm -hmm. and this and that. 
And to me, I'd be like, what is the business case? And the reality is, the real world of things, we get an engineer's prototype and we have to kind of like remove all the wiring and rewire it because uh -huh. it was just like, who came up with this? <laughs> yeah. But in a happy world, I think it would, they would talk to business and understand, hey, we need a building. Yeah. And then they would go to someone like Dimitri and say, hey, these are our requirements. These are how many people need to fit in this building. Right. And he's going to now design the blueprints of the building mm -hmm. um, and then obviously test to make sure that it can handle the flow of workers or people who are staying there, right. yeah. bathrooms or kitchens needed to be in there. And then from there, once it gets approved, then it's going to come down to me to finish before right. we can send it to the coders to build it, actually. Yeah. Do you typically test the visuals before anything gets built, like with research? You could. Um, I've seen that happen where we were test, like in my previous prior job at LG, we would test color material fin finished survey styles. Like okay. we would have pictures in the survey, mm -hmm. we would check out what colors are trending uh -huh. among our segmentation, uh -huh. and then like what textures are trending. Basically back in the days in feature phones when you had like different shapes right. and textures, yeah. uh, that was a lot of that in survey testing with segmentation so that mm -hmm. we go to our buyers, basically Verizon or T-Mobile and stuff, and say, well, here's the segmentation data. He, these are the kind of phones that they're interested. They like the Burberry, they mm -hmm. like the blue, right. or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think that um, obviously, like you, you can do that. There's nothing really stopping anyone from doing that. But I do feel like for digital products, especially, um, and a lot of products already exist. Like there's, there's obviously startups. There are places where you will build a thing from completely from scratch. Um, but by and large, a lot of the products are iterative in mm -hmm. nature, and so it does become the UI designer's responsibility to make sure that whatever the final look and, and feel of the thing that we're building is, that it you know, integrates well into the existing system. And so to that point, like doing research around like what color would this, should this button be is kind of like, well, it, we have our... We have our colors oh, already uh, yeah. for yeah. this application, so I mean, it really just depends. I guess so that the mindset would be: would researchers also be analysts after the fact, like seeing the data coming in? Why would they not? I don't know. I mean, oh. I, I, I this kind of goes, yeah. Because it goes we back to kind the of do, point do that, like point. look at the what is the fallout, the dropout points uh -huh. on the path. Why is it like twenty percent when it should be more? Like so as designers, you guys look at that data? Yeah. Oh, okay. But I think the most important thing to remember holistically is, especially when you're testing, is um, you're, you're wanting to understand why the testers prefer right. a certain thing right. instead of what they prefer. Of course. Because that's the biggest difference. Um, and then from there, you could start to delineate why they like something and maybe determine if you could improve the design in a certain way. But, you know... We have seen a lot of what's called false false positives, where they say, "Oh, they liked um, prototype B, therefore these colors are amazing." Right. That's a completely wrong way to yeah. interpret something. Yeah. Um, so the the why they like something is the most key thing. And then taking that internally and making internal decisions because I've seen that process of surveying, um, and when you get into high quant data. It still comes from the gut. It still comes from the team that has to make that decision mm -hmm. of what they're seeing in from their testing. And I will admit that survey was from the world of marketing research, okay, as opposed to user. Which research. is different, right? Yeah, it it is different. I, um, but some of their tools are similar. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, it's just like the motive for for right. the test is a little bit different. We've spoken a little bit about um, the connection between UX research and design. We talked about the two different types of design we have. Um, and you guys did mention how research can be helpful, right, um, for design. But I'm very curious to know, in your experience, how has UX research been an obstacle or a roadblock in your work process? 
Um, well, I mean, I have thoughts on this, obviously. Um, it really comes down to, for me, it comes down to team alignment. Okay. Um, that's really the, the m most major sort of pain point that I've encountered with research is making sure that everyone on the team is aware of what, uh, what we're testing and what the problems are that we're trying to solve. Okay. Um, and making sure that, because you can do research forever, right? That's right, one yeah, like when do you stop? Like, you can totally get into analysis paralysis. That's why it's so important to like, <laughs> to understand what problem you're trying to solve yeah. instead of like just throwing out a million different things to test and getting into this, you know, infinite loop of, well, you know, what about you this other? You basically time box yourself. Yeah, so right. you have deadlines, right? And you're like, yeah. by this date, we need to make a design design decision, mm -hmm. and so all the research you can do until that point. Right, and it's, it, so there's like the research that you do ahead of time right. to understand what problems exist, and then there's the research to validate whether or not your design actually solves those problems, uh -huh. right? So like that second phase of validating whether or not the design solves the problems is the one where you can, you know, get into like issues. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, I mean, if that's kind of our job is to, you know, like we're supposed to use our knowledge of, you know, what what's out already in the world, like what are the patterns, the UX patterns for the platform that we're designing for to come up with solutions that mm -hmm. generally will pass those tests mm -hmm. with some, you know, slight modifications. Um, and then the other thing is having the trust of the team in the research that's being done and right. communicating the research in a transparent way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because I've seen that as well where you have you know teams that do their own research, but the designs that, that they produce um, do not necessarily like, you know, fit into the standards of the platform uh, okay. and like so they basically like they don't really have the knowledge of the design systems right like all the challenges for instance like we see the um, researchers that are doing mobile web mm -hmm. and said these are their finding but we're like that's not mobile application they're uh -huh. two different right. beasts okay okay it's like orange comparing so oranges and apples is that like the researchers fault for not being aware of the product standards prior to doing the research? Uh, I think it's, it's a combination. It, it's a combination of your own personality mm -hmm. and um, you can be biased yourself. Right, of course. Of um, course. And it's, it's, it's really about your self-awareness. Mm -hmm. You want to learn why your research did not work with this set of designers. Mm -hmm. Just do research on them. Mm -hmm. And then you get insights about how you improve your process. Right, right, right. That makes sense. Okay. Do you have anything to add? Yeah. Okay. I mean, research can be like hieroglyphics, right? <laughs> oh, Many yeah. people can <laughs> interpret <laughs> it in different ways. Um, but it's very important, like Dimitri said, is research has to be very open. Um, and everyone should be able to see the process you took in order to get to where you um, gave the results so that people can see what's going on. Um, it's you can actually do more harm than good by giving people false information. Um, I hate to use building examples, but research Keep it, going. <laughs> it, is, it is the foundation of a building. And if you have a faulty foundation, if you have a crack in it, you know you're going to destroy everything after it. So it's very important that you take your time, make sure you do the steps correctly, and get the correct information so that you're giving people, you know, right. not fake news. Yeah. Yeah, I think. A researcher, a really good one, a one that are very aware of their own bias and opinion, mm -hmm. that they will craft their questions and their research in the most neutral way right. possible. Mm -hmm. And then I think I've always found friction for the ones who are completely biased. Mm -hmm. And I would confront that, <laughs> and I want them to be like, oh, be human. Uh -huh. Like, you will make right. a mistake. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, and just be human about it. Just be like, "Yep, that was my bad. Yeah, I right. made a lead-on question right there." Yeah. yeah, I feel like I understand what you're talking about, and sometimes when I have to do concept testing or I have more than one version of a prototype or design to test, um, I look at one and I'm like, <laughs> I, I personally feel like, "No, right. I don't like this. Nobody's gonna like yeah. this, right?" And yes. then another one, I'm like, "Okay." And then I say 
something like, well, I like this from this version, and I like this from that version, and if we could like hybrid those two together, I feel like that would be a good design. Um, and mind you, I'm not a designer, but um, just doing user research so much that, but it is also my gut feeling, my intuition, you know, that that's personally aligned with my opinions and my beliefs. Um, and usually I'm right, actually, that happens. <laughs> because you have uh, done so much yeah, research. Yeah, yeah. It's like, because you, you understand the different types of people that exist, like on both extremes of the spectrum. Um, and so I remember even we had a situation where it was like, the, the, the bottom navigation tabs or like having everything expanded. So um, yeah, and I think I think that it's very fair point that everyone kind of introduces their own bias to things, but um, overall, yeah, research is really designed, a researcher is part of a design team, you know, to help the process, right? Um, not obviously to hinder it, but we know that given deadlines, given things like poor research planning, right, causes this crack in our foundation and therefore uh, the, the, I, the research crumbles. <laughs> I will have to say, like, collaboration is highly important if you don't want to have roadblocks later down in the research and the design. Right. Um, and not like just in, between design and in research. In industry in general, like yes. in your yeah. whole team, which Absolutely. is like team because, alignment that you were like, talking about. I was a naive, like, junior designer that came into medical design. Uh huh. And now, after many years, I realized that was a smart thing that the business model was is whenever they only hire one researcher, mm -hmm. like a consultant for a project, mm -hmm. they don't hire two. Mm -hmm. What they do is they take that one researcher and then take an industrial designer or a designer in general mm -hmm. and tag along and do all the note taking and the video taking. Because if you hear like in your methodologies, you should have two people co-piloting with each other, uh -huh. one who's the interviewee, like interviewing right. the uh -huh. participant and the other one taking notes and yeah. making sure that's how they, did it at the agency. Uh huh. Okay. To getting the designers more familiar with research mm -hmm. and appreciating what it is that they're doing, mm -hmm. and getting designers into the field of like medical design and the complexity that's right. in that office, or right? In that um, facility of yeah. some sort. Yeah. I think I think that's a great point. I also think it's interesting for like. Um, you know, team meetings, but not like the boring kind where everyone like sits there and doesn't listen to what the other is working on. Yeah. But I think that maybe like as a researcher, you don't know what a designer may be going through, you know, and like to establish some sort of sympathy and kind of, you know, like right. get everyone on the yeah, same yeah, page yeah. with exactly. each other. I think that having visibility into everyone's right. own little world <laughs> right. is yeah. very useful and just making yeah. because yeah, it's it's literally just about cultivating that like team dynamic where everyone trusts everyone. To do, to do their job and like you know if our researcher is presenting research I can clearly see like the methodology you know what the actual participants said right, what right. the suggestions are right. and like have those discussions just having that transparency goes a really long way yeah. in making sure that everyone's on the same page cool. yeah and it helps um, getting up out of your desk and walking over and saying hey come check something out right um, you know taking them along for the ride when you get buy-in early with your teammates, um, there's nothing to sell at the end because everyone's been you. pulling in the same direction exactly. the whole yeah. time. Yeah. Great, awesome. I actually have a question that I didn't prepare you for. Um, surprise question. Um, so we know that design fixation is a thing, right? And we know that working in tech, that's moving very quickly and there are constantly competitors coming out with, with products, right? It's like we're often faced with the question, do we design something very similarly to a product that already exists because people know how to use it? Or do we try to come up with something innovative and creative and novel to make us better? So how do you personally, I mean, I understand that working at a company, there are certain standards, ah, you like this question. <laughs> there are certain standards that a company establishes and you have to design by those standards, but like, how do you personally deal with design fixation? It's a great question. Um, I'll lead it off. Um, it, I think it depends on how complex the tasks are that the user has to do on your website or app. Um, I think if it's very easy, um, I think you have more leeway on what you want to do or what type of creative freedom you want to do. But I think if it is a more complex task, you know, the process they have to do is five or six screens. Um, I do think your uh, air 
errors that you'll get of people bouncing out will increase the more complexity it is. Um, say for, you know, if, it's, if it is a Maps and it looks just like Google Maps, they know how to interact with it, then their ease of use is gonna be really high. They're gonna use it really easily, they'll use it often, um, and their, um, the time it takes for them to get to know something is gonna be a lot lower. So it's, it's those pros and cons. Um, every company wants to be unique. They want their brand image to shout you know, their name. They want everyone to see those colors and be like, oh, that's that company. Um, so every company's gonna want that. I think it's your job to balance that, um, inject it as much as possible, but, but still make it you know, discernible. You know? Like every design language kind of has its, its language. Like you know, if you're an English speaker, you know, it's gonna be easy to converse with other people that are English speaking. So keep that in mind. Um, so are you thinking aesthetically like skeuomorphism and flat? Or Ooh, skeuomorphism, you, we like yeah, that word. Design. Or you're talking about tech, tech, like I'm sensors. talking about you, you. Like if they say, Gwen, I need you to design me a flow for how to convert what is typically written on paper in hotels to a TV screen. Yeah. Like, do you ever have, like, writers have writer's block and you're like, I don't know where to start, I don't know how to be creative with this, especially if it's something new that's never yeah. been done? I think you just hit oh, on the thing. Oh! Uh, <laughs> well, so, yeah, I've been playing in that kind of new, new space uh -huh. for so long, so... Oh, it's not new to you anymore? It's, it's, it's new to the point that I kind of have a, like, just do it. Okay. And you just like like I, trial and error kind so of thing. So I always I always call it design improv. Okay, design improv. Okay, okay. Um, so whenever I give in this like, or some people might call actually from the trends is called imposter syndrome. Okay. But I don't call it imposter syndrome because I only have it for like a split second, okay. and then I'm like, let's do this. <laughs> oh, imposter syndrome, as in like you have an idea and then you shoot it down. Like, no, no, you, you, oh. you you're. You, you belittle yourself inside, uh -huh. thinking you're not good enough. Oh, for this right. Like you can't come up with a solution okay. to this problem. You would never okay. come up no with a solution. No imposter syndrome. We don't so want that. It's just, it's just like the TV, for instance, mm -hmm. that I had that feeling of like, where to start. Mm -hmm. and, and same thing with IP cameras, smart home devices, like plugs, smart plugs, and light bulbs and stuff. And then even smartphones, when Android came into the market, mm -hmm. start with analyzing the competition. Mm -hmm. Okay, analyze the competition. Okay. Like that way, you get familiar with what everyone is doing because when it's new, new, everyone is not in a standard. Right. And everyone's fighting with each other to become a standard. Right. Like Samsung Galaxy is now a standard for an Android device besides mm -hmm. the Pixel. Mm -hmm but like everyone is familiar with the UI for Samsung. Mm -hmm. But back in those days, it was HTC, Motorola, LG, and Samsung, and then like other smaller players just like, ah, I'm yeah. gonna make the next Android yeah, yeah, yeah. phone yeah. with their own skin. And I would analyze it first and go, okay, what insights, what rationales or implications have you learned from it? Mm -hmm. And then okay. go into like your bubble mm -hmm. and come up with some cool shit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wise words. Yeah. <laughs> Dimitri, I, how I was, do you come up with cool stuff. things? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I was just going to piggyback on what you had just mentioned, the whole like new stuff. Because I feel like for me, the way that I approach it is you know, I'm working on a mobile app. There's millions of mobile apps out there, so it's actually quite remarkable how some people don't do a competitive analysis of similar features and other that other people have already designed. Mm -hmm. There's just not that many like completely novel problems. Um, it's more about just creatively applying solutions that you've already discovered um, through you know your own experience, through your observations through prior research um, and you know combining them in ways to solve the problem at hand. So I feel like the the true like wild west of of design and coming up with things that are completely innovative really rests on the bleeding edge of what technology is currently capable of. So like Which AR, like, VR, but, all but those like types by of the time, let's say by the time you 
like started coming up with something and then you need to test it to make sure blah 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 there's like already a new version mm -hmm. of that thing that you were already testing you know because like the speed at which they yeah. move in tech right. is crazy so yeah. i'm sure that as designers i mean you guys feel that just pressure. don't get caught up in the design right okay yeah just to design solve the problem right okay. like that is always the first thing but also, you, what you, is the problem when it comes to new new? We like right. VR. Like, what's the problem? Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and that's okay. yeah. But also, like, <laughs> I would say understand the rules of design so that you know how to bend them and break them when you go into a new space that you've never designed for, or there's nothing to competitively analysis right. with. So if you know those those foundations well, those rules, mm -hmm. you could break them and change them and morph them into yeah, something right. that that's. And I mean, that doesn't just apply to design, that applies to programming, that apply, I'm sure that applies to business. It's basically, there's like, yeah, there's like a foundation underneath all of this stuff, like for UI design, it's, you know, it's like typography, hierarchy, you know, how you group elements together, like how you create consistency. And do you, do you study that in school? Or, well, no. I, I didn't in you school, did. okay. but I studied that on my I mean, own. Time. On your own. I constantly just, refresh myself. Well, okay. Kyle was mentioning having a foundation. That's what design schools would do. Okay. They may not know or have the right uh, mentors okay. in that environment uh -huh. in the new new space. Or okay. Like how to got you, it? You kind of have to take the leap of doing your own research, of finding those okay. companies, and being an intern, and oh. getting your foot in the door to find those mentors. Okay. Cool. You, so, would you say that you agree with the fact that as a designer, you have to have an element of creativity? Hundred percent. Yes. You have to see two moves ahead. I, okay. I, so, this is from a bias in opinion. Okay. Um, what is design and what is creativity? I see them as two separate things. You can be a designer and not be creative, or you can be extremely creative. Do you think you'd be a good designer without creativity? You need a little bit of creativity. Okay. You don't, right. you don't need to be like, yeah, like yeah. a fashion designer. Right, right, right. right, right, right. I, I totally see where you're going with that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because design inherently is supposed to solve problems. Right. And okay. a lot of problems aren't necessarily like that creative to solve, mm -hmm. you know? Like there's just a very practical thing that needs to happen and right. you need to be able to facilitate that. Um, so that, it's more of like you mentioned, thinking on your feet, knowing, like, like yeah. being able to think quickly, think critically, so it's a lot of that, right? And yeah. knowing the rules in order to be able to break them in innovative Right, ways. well yeah. for like UI designers, I think it's, it's more important to have more of that creative element mm -hmm. and to have more of an eye for things. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, if you think about how like people, you know, people come up with new products and new designs. Like, there's definitely an element of creativity, even though they're reusing a lot of the same elements. There's still buttons. There's still right. images. There's still, right. yeah. you yeah, know, like all those foundational rules still apply, but they're just being reused in and creative ways. And those libraries exist for free. Out right. right. Okay. So, so the resources are out there. Yeah. Um, great. And then just to wrap up, um, because I have a lot of students often ask me. Um, like what advice do you have for me if I want to go into UX research, right? And I'm sure uh, similarly, a lot of viewers will have the question, you know, what advice do you have for me if I want to go into UX design? And given that I don't know anything much about this field, um, you know, it would be great if you guys could um, give your advice for that. Um, so I would say my advice is you're always going to be a student. Um, I think that the learning never ends um, because everything's constantly evolving, everything's changing. Um, and so I would say set time aside each week to really read stuff. Um, and it doesn't have to be your specific field. Um, I'm, I went to her to ask for some research books and read some books about how to conduct interviews and stuff like that. So you actually. Um, just read everything you can. Keep reading, always learn, never think that you know it all because you don't. Um, and probably the stuff you do know, um, you're doing it wrong or not as good as you could. So, <laughs> seriously, so like, you know, put your uh, pride to the side and just always be a student of learning. Um, and keep pushing yourself, always do things that you think you suck at. Like, with my free time, like I could not illustrate anything ever. Like, I could not draw a building in Photoshop or Illustrator. And so I, my free time I did um, once a week for like a couple months and eventually I was able to illustrate things and do it for, fairly well. So 
Um, you never know unless you kick your butt and you get out there and you do it. Um, same thing about always being a student of learning, um, but it can be overwhelming because you're in the internet, there's medium and there's so many blogs telling you what to do here, this way, this way, this way. So have a game plan, like what it is you want to learn and practice. So like what Michael Gladwell was mentioning in one of his books about thousand hours, you don't have to do the thousand hours, but even just doing two hour exercise every single day and posting them on Verbal or on other social media, you can get feedback from the public that way. And then you don't have to get hung up on a design. You just rapidly make, move on, rapidly make, because that was the one first lesson from my like first mentor. It's like, you made it, move on. Put it in the trash and go. And then I'm like, oh, but it's my baby. Mm -hmm. And then she was like, no, this is gonna be your career. This is gonna be like the rest of your life. You're gonna constantly be making stuff. So just have, just be willing to move on to the next thing. Yeah, so I, I mean, I second everything that you guys have already said. Um, obviously for me, like learning is huge. You know, I, I spend, I'm very introverted by nature, so I, I like to go inwards and I like to spend a lot of time reading about new stuff, whether it's, you know, UX design, UI design, programming, like all that stuff, just being interested in the space in general and just developing your domain knowledge um, will go a very long way. Being able to communicate with all the different teams, so having a little bit of visibility into what everyone actually does in their day to day, like what is an API or, you know, like what are all these things, what, how, like download Xcode, you know, and just see what's in there. You don't even have to know how to program. There's just like stuff in there and you'll see there's reusable UI elements and that gives you visibility into, okay, well, Apple literally decided that these are the, the baseline tools that we're gonna to give to our developers to, to help make stuff faster. Um, so, you know, it's just a million different things that you can do. I think like what Gwen was saying, it's important to be structured and to, to sort of like try and put some guardrails um, in terms of what you're trying to learn initially and what the basic, like the foundational skills are that you're going to need in order to at least start in the field. Um, there's a lot of information on the internet about that um, so I think that just yeah everything just comes down to um, putting in the work you know and trying to put yourself out there and um, make sure that you know you get feedback get feedback from people that are around you it doesn't have to be people that know anything about design you know practice running your own usability tests on the, the two-hour designs that you do you know all that stuff will get you a feel for what the discipline actually involves and then also try imitating stuff, you know? Try and make the interfaces that you love and just, because that will get your you mind get working on, you know, why did they make all these decisions? As you're sitting there pushing the pixels around and moving stuff into their respective positions, think about how it's gonna function. How are things gonna transition? Like, as you as you do things, the, the um, things will connect in your brain. I do that to Kyle's columns. <laughs> I'll open up his vials and go, Smart. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna do that. I did that. the same thing actually with illustration, you know. I was like, I, I can't I can't do it. Like I don't know, should I use sketch or should I do? And so yeah, it's the same thing, you know. You're always just trying to improve whatever you're weakest at. Um, and so just pick a place and, and hit the ground running. And don't don't feel overwhelmed. Like, you know, nobody, nobody knows it all. Yeah, know? no one knows it all. What I say is like, regardless of how big your the something is you're trying to learn, just break it into small, chewable bites, yeah. and eventually you'll get to the end of it. I mean, that's why there's so many different roles in design. There's mm -hmm. UI, there's UX, there's research, and then of course strategy. there's product management on that, and then we got hybrid roles within all those. So. Thanks everyone for tuning in on this episode of The Dancing Professor. We hope you enjoyed our design discussion and uh, feel free to reach out to csundancingprofessor at gmail.com if you have any questions for our awesome designers. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Bye.